All right, so welcome back, everyone. Um, this is a overview um, that I took from OpenStax College um, from uh, Wikipedia, just to have like a zoomed-in view of how DNA looks in detail. So DNA and RNA are, are very, very similar. Um, um, so it doesn't really matter if you look at DNA or RNA, um, but had the two strands um, of DNA. So we see the, the, the forward strand and we have the reverse strand. Um, and of course we have something called the five prime end to the three prime end. So when we write down a DNA sequence, we always write it down five prime to three prime. And then we have the, the coding strand and the template strand. Um, and that is kind of arbitrary, right? The, the, some genes are coded on the negative strand, meaning um, that they are actually on the, on the other side of the DNA. But um, so DNA con consists of two major parts. So one of the parts is the base pairs, which we always write down. Um, but besides that, we have this sugar, sugar phosphate backbone. Um, and like uh, modifications like epigenetics generally happen to the backbone. Um, so the backbones are modified, but it can also be that the individual base pairs are being modified. Um, and these two strands are kept together by hydrogen bonds. Um, and that is something which the PCR technique actually relies on um, because PCR technique relies on um, increasing the temperature. Um, increasing the temperature means that hydrogen bond starts start breaking and the two strands are able to separate from each other so we can do things like um, copy the DNA or transcribe parts of the DNA. So if we look at DNA versus RNA, so this is a kind of a different representation. Again, you see the, the backbone, you see the different base pairs. Um, and the first thing that is uh, very different between DNA and RNA is that they're instead of a T, so in, in, instead of a T base, um, in RNA we have something called uracil, so an, a U base. So when you write down a DNA sequence, you're using C, G, A, and T. Uh, and when you're writing down an RNA, codon, more or less, or an RNA, DNA, an RNA code, um, you would write down C, G, A, and U. Um, so the only difference between T and U is, is that this, this little CH3 group um, is not there when you are talking about Gracil. So they are very similar. One of the other things which directly is striking from this image is that RNA and DNA both more or less occur in helical forms. Um, yeah, so they, from there's a natural tendency for DNA to kind of form in a helix or a double helix. Um, RNA doesn't really do that. RNA is generally single-stranded. There are there is double-stranded RNA, but double-stranded RNA is very uncommon. And um, for example, eukaryotic cells will more or less destroy all double-stranded RNA because it's it's considered dangerous because a lot of viruses they use double-stranded RNA um, as their genetic material so if 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 a eukaryotic cell encounters um, double-stranded RNA within the cytosol um, then it will directly degrade the double-stranded RNA which is where silencing um, so and, uh, RNA silencing is based on so just a single overview. So what are all of the differences between DNA and RNA? Well, I already told you that RNA generally is single-stranded. DNA is, is almost always double-stranded. The bases are slightly different. So an RNA molecule contains uracil, while a DNA molecule contains thymine. Um, the sugar backbone is slightly different. So the, the RNA has a ribose backbone and DNA has a deoxyribose. Um, so that means that um, the deoxyribose has, a, uh, has an H group and the ribose has an OH group. And um, if you think back about chemistry, then um, OH, so an oxygen with a hydrogen or an H, um, the OH is much more reactive. That means that in water, um, RNA degrades much faster than uh, the, the backbone of RNA gets attacked by the water molecules. Um, so this OH group is, is kind of making RNA much more uh, reactive in a way. So, um, but hey, it's just a slight difference in the backbone, um, but it is a major difference biochemically speaking. Um, so the size of RNA is generally relatively small, while DNA is relatively big. Hemp DNA comes in whole chromosomes, which hemp are 
really, really long, millions or billions of base pairs, um, RNA generally is small, very small. Um, the location um, is uh, DNA is in the nucleus of a cell while RNA moves from the nucleus to the cytoplasm although there's RNA which can be found exclusively to the nucleus as well um, but generally hey, it's a difference that DNA is not found outside of the nucleus while RNA is found outside of the nucleus so just a quick overview between the differences between DNA and RNA all right and then we end up in the um, part of the lecture that I like the least and that is telling you about all of the different types of RNA that are there. So these are the types of RNA that I will be talking about and um, I hope that I can make clear what all of the differences are. Um, so we have a lot of these short names as well so we it, you guys just have to remember that. So um, the main form of RNA, which we've been talking about a lot, is messenger RNA. Messenger RNA comes in two forms, so you have hnRNA and you have mRNA. So mRNA is the, the, the ready RNA, so the mature RNA, and hnRNA is the pre-mRNA. So the difference between these two is that this one has still the introns in it. Um, besides that, we have transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, small nuclear RNAs. We also have S small nuclear organelle RNA, S and O RNAs. We have catalytic RNAs, which are called ribozymes. We have microRNAs, which are miRNAs. We have small interfering RNAs, siRNAs, and we have non-coding RNAs, which are ncRNAs. All right, so let's look at these a little bit more in detail. Right, so messenger RNA or M mRNA or hnRNA comes in two forms. So we have the pre-mRNA, which is called hnRNA, which is called hnRNA, and then this is spliced and to produce the mature, mature RNA. So the introns, right? If you have the structure of an of an RNA, then hey, you have an exon. Um, there's an untranslated region at the beginning and at the end. So these are for stability of the RNA and also directing the ribosome on how many proteins to make from this R RNA. Um, but hey, if you look at the pre-mRNA, so the hnRNA, um, it has an exon and then generally it has some introns and exons. So the exons are the parts which are coding for the protein. Um, and of course, different exons can be retained or script to produce several protein transactions transcripts from the same gene. So a single gene on the genome, a single sequence, um, generally I think on average in the human genome a single gene produces four to five different proteins, um, which is a lot. So um, have we have 20,000 genes encoded on a human genome or around 20,000 genes, but Protein-wise, a human cell can produce up to like 100,000 to 120,000 different proteins, um, depending on how you count. Um, and this is because hey, it could couple this exon all the way to that exon and just skip out the exon in the middle. Yeah, so there's different ways of combining these uh, together. So the ORF, so the ORF, the open reading frame. Um, so the open reading frame is the final kind of sense making sequence of codons um, that is translated into uh, a peptide chain by the ribosomes. And these peptide chains are then called proteins. So the start of uh, where in the mRNA um, the ribosome starts making proteins is in 99.9% .9 of the cases an ATG. So in the DNA sequence, ATG codes for a methionine when it's somewhere in the middle of the protein. But when we start reading the mRNA, so when we look at the mature mRNA, we start at the beginning and then the first letter, so the, the first time that ATG occurs, that is where the ribosome starts transcribing uh, the, um, the protein. So many proteins also have a methionine first. Um, so a lot of proteins, like 90% of the proteins, start with a methionine. 
Um, and then there's a stop codon, and the stop codon can be coded in different by different three-letter codons uh, of RNA, um, and that is UAG, UAA, or UGA. So those are the stop codons, and those direct the ribosome to stop translating the mRNA at that point and to release the um, the, the protein into into the the cytosol or uh, the endoplasmatic reticulum, depending on where uh, synthesis occurs. And then of course the UTRs, the untranslated regions at the beginning and at the end, are there for lifespan control of the RNA. So they, they make sure that the RNA is not degraded during transport, um, but they also, um, they also encode like the number of proteins that should be made from a single uh, messenger RNA. So, Alright, messenger RNA. We already talked a lot about it. So. The next form is the tRNA. So the tRNAs are really, really interesting because they are coded into the genome and the tRNAs, they always have this clover leaf structure. Um, so hey, you have a, um, you have a, you have the five prime beginning hey, and then the RNA folds back on itself three times to make these three different uh, stems and then you have the, the kind of uh, acceptor stem in the end um, and here at the three prime end there, this is where the amino acid is actually coupled to the tRNA. So tRNA is an RNA molecule which has a single amino acid attached here to the three prime OH group um, and here the A uh, and the AOH so this free part is then coupled to a um, amino acid and of course the loop on the bottom here so this is called the anticodon loop so here there are base pairs uh, which are encoding which which three-letter base pair this tRNA should bind to so based on the anticodon loop um, also the amino acid is uh, attached here so um, they are loaded and then there's the D loop and then you have the uh, T phi C loop and the T phi C loop is here and then you still have this little variable part um, which makes for we don't really know exactly what it does. Yeah, but the tRNAs are the physical link between the RNA sequence and the amino acid sequence of the protein. And since n every animal more or less has its own structure of tRNAs, because tRNAs are just encoded on the genome, so that means that there are mutations occurring in these tRNAs as well. So this means that based on mutations inside of these tRNAs, you can see if a sequence is more or less um, human specific or if it's mouse specific or if it's specific for another uh, animal. So uh, the, the DNA code is more or less equal for everyone, um, but these tRNAs are there to kind of, um, well, they, 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 they make a codon uh, more or less uh, specific. So hey, it can be that, for example, ATG, right, which codes for a methionine, um, is coding for a methionine in mouse and in human. Um, but in mouse and human, there can be different tRNAs which are which are coupling there. So the, the, there's something called codon optimization, um, which you can do to make codons optimized for a specific species. So tRNA between 73 and 94 nucleotides long and it always comes in this clover leaf structure um, and it's a very fascinating molecule so we will come back to it um, again. So how does this work? So how are peptides synthesized? Well we have the ribosome, uh, the ribosome consists of two parts, in this figure it's just a single ribosome, um, but what happens is, is that you have the messenger RNA, the messenger RNA is pulled through the ribosome. In the ribosome there are three sites. So you have the first site, the entry site, where the tRNA kind of is is matched with the codon on the mRNA. Um, then you have an intermediate site where the binding between the two um, amino acids occur and then you have the exit site. Um, so the empty tRNA is then more or less thrown out of the ribosome um, at when, when the, the next tRNA comes in. So if we look at this in a little bit more detail, then here we have the small subunit, so the, the bottom part of the, uh, uh, of the ribosome. We have the large subunit, which is the upper part of the ribosome. Uh, what happens is the mRNA is pulled through the, um, through the uh, uh, 
through the ribosome um, and what we see is that there is a matching of tRNAs towards the sequence um, then we go to the A site the A site is where the um, where the matching occurs the A site is then moved to the P site during this move the um, the amino acid is coupled to the newly born protein and then after the P site we get the exit site and the, the, the empty tRNA is discarded so um, how uh, just in detail so we have the A site um, which is the uh, amino acyl site uh, which is the binding site for the charged tRNA then we have the P site for peptidyl and it holds the tRNA which is linked to the growing polypeptide chain and then we have the E site which is the exit site which is the final binding site for the tRNA before being injected from the ribosome so hey, there's there it's like a, a three-stroke engine and so as soon as something new binds into the A site, the, P, uh, the, A, the previous A site is moved to the P site, and the P site is moved to the E site, and the E site is made empty. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of a, an engine which just continuously runs and, and synthesizes proteins. All right, so the ribosome itself also contains RNA. So the ribosome is a protein, but it's a protein, and as a cofactor of this protein, there are several RNAs. So uh, ribosomes contain RNAs. Contain, uh, these RNAs are called rRNAs. Um, so in prokaryotes, we have uh, 23, 23S RNA, 5S RNA, and 16S RNA. And S here stands for the sedimentation speed, so it has to do with the size of these RNAs. Um, and in eukaryotes, we actually have four RNAs um, inside of the ribosome called 28S, 5.8S, 5S, and 18S. Um, and these RNAs in the in the in the ribosome itself, they they are there to recognize the different tRNAs because there has to be a coupling to the tRNAs to the mRNA, um, and it recognizes an R mRNA sequence. So there is there is the ribosome itself is a protein, but there are RNAs in there to facilitate the recognition because of course RNA can only bind to RNA itself um, and it cannot directly bind to a protein. So the, the ribosome contains um, either three or four RNAs to facilitate this binding and to match the proper amino acid with the proper codon uh, using the tRNAs. All right, so let's take a look at the three-day visualization that I made. Um, so people always say never do a live demo, but I'm still going to do a live demo. Um, so I took uh, one of the biggest structures from the protein database. Um, let me shut down the sound actually. And let's hope that it loads it in. Very good. So now I can add a new window capture. All right, and this is the window that I want to capture. Um, so this is um, my 3D engine. Um, you can see that it's also it, it can also be used to visualize other things. Uh, let me make it a little bit bigger for you guys. Um, this one make it a little bit bigger. All right, so here we see um, the the upper part of the ribosome. So um, what you see here is is um, the amino acid chains, uh, which are um, which are these little um, uh, kind of squares right so an, an amino acid has four um, um, sides more or less so it's a planar um, um, it's a planar amino acid and then you have the groups so the side groups so you can see the side groups here um, if you look a little bit closer can I zoom in a little bit more um, and then all of these little dots here are the different dots which are the different molecules um, that are inside of the ribosome and when you zoom out then you can I don't know if it's that clear on Twitch, but here in the bottom you can see a couple of these uh, tRNAs. I think it's not clear enough for you guys, um, at least when I look at the recording. But had this, uh, this little program that I wrote allows you to look at all of the different amino acid chains. So hey, in total um, there are uh, 57 peptide chains. Of, or 57 different peptide chains which make up a ribosomal protein. Um, there are uh, around 
we can see some dots yeah yeah can you see that it looks like a like a helical structure with little blue dots in the middle and then like the red dots on the outside uh, for me the window is relatively small since I'm looking okay so you can see the really nice RNA kind of DNA looking structure so this is the RNA um, which is inside of the ribosome that facilitates it and then hey, in total um, what you see here is the 57 peptide chain so it's not a single protein it's a protein which is made up of 57 different proteins um, a ribosome is around 11,000 amino acids in total um, and if you look at the whole thing then it contains around hundred and fifty thousand different atoms um, to to do that um, and, and you can see actually that there's a little hole in here um, so the hole here this is where the RNA is pulled through the ribosome um, and then the other hole which should be here on the top which is not that clear let me see so this is the hole for the messenger RNA and then there's a hole on the top well that it well you can't really see the hole but here on the top um, this is where the the mature protein comes out so you can you can look at it and I, I just like visualizing stuff um, and and this is something that I made. It does other things as well. It also renders a solar system and other stupid stuff. So you can you can also look at a model of the of the sun and, and that kind of thing. Um, but it's something that I made, which I think is uh, um, interesting. So hey, it's it, when people talk. Ooh, I'm having real issues currently with. <laughs> okay. So, um, but it, it's, it's just an interesting like visualization that had to show you guys that the ribosome is really one of these immense proteins within the cell. Um, and this is kind of the, the link between eh, how proteins are made, how RNA is kind of translated into proteins. Um, so it's the most important protein kind of in, in, in the cell. All right, so let's continue. So besides these messenger RNAs and ribosomal RNAs, we also have small nuclear RNAs called snRNAs. So these are RNAs which are located in the nucleus, um, not so much in, in, in the whole nucleus of the cell, but in very specific parts of, uh, of, an, of the nucleus. And one of the things that these things do is, do the, is facilitate the splicing, because again, when you splice out the introns from the mRNA to produce uh, mature mRNA uh, this of course has to be facilitated using RNA because only RNA can bind RNA um, so there's a protein which uses s small nuclear RNAs to detect where the introns are or the introns and the exons are and then they there's a cutting mechanism to kind of cut out these parts um, and so the spliceosome so this big protein which does the splicing um, is a protein RNA complex um, and this has five different little nuclear RNAs in there and these are called U1, U2, U4, U5 and U6 why they didn't name them U1 to U5 but skipped U3 I don't know exactly um, and this, this whole spliceosome complex is again something which is made out of 150 different proteins um, and it is built up in parts so you have the, the first parts binding and then other parts binding and then and the, uh, the RNA is pulled together to make a little loop and then the RNA is again fused together um, so these uh, sh um, small nuclear RNAs along with their associated proteins form a ribonuclease protein complex which is called SNRNPs um, which bind to specific sequences on these pre-mRNAs. Um, so did I have a... Yeah, so these, these small nuclear RNAs are found within something which is called the splicing speckles and inside the cagel bodies of the cell nucleus. So if you look at the cell nucleus, um, it has these pores in there to facilitate transfer in and out of the nucleus. And alongside these pores, there's these little speckles. So it's and the cell surface is not a it's not a flat surface, but there's these little pouches um, near the big holes where stuff is being transported in and out. And these are called the splicing speckles. And these are there to just do one thing and that is the pre-processing so the processing of pre-mRNA into mRNA so splicing is the process of removing introns and there are two known types of splicing and those are U12 uh, and U2 splicing so when you look at the um, 
at the mRNA, then here you see the um, exon, here you see the other exon, and here you have the intron. And the codes here after the introns are more or less fixed because these are the, the codes that are being recognized. Um, so here you have the, the one splice site here, uh, then you have the splice site at the three prime end, and then in the middle here you have something which is the branch site and the branch site here is the thing that is kind of different between U2 and U12 splicing and so the, the sequence here where the, the new exon begins is more or less always the same it's YAG um, here it's uh, GURAGU and in the other one it's also very similar like GUA and yeah, but the, the branch site here in the middle that determines if there will be a U2 or a U2 U12 splicing going on. So and there's a, it's a very highly regulated process where these two parts of the introns, uh, where the intron is cut out and where the exons are more or less fused together again uh, to produce a single um, mature messenger RNA. Um, so I won't go into detail. I, in the previous lectures I always had like a very detailed way of how this splicing works and which splicing factors bind in which order, but I don't think that that's important. Just remember um, that splicing happens in the splicing speckles, which are near the pores of the nucleus, um, and it, there are two different types of splicing, and splicing is either U2 or U12. Um, and there are three sequences which are important for that, one at the five prime end, one at the three prime end, and one more or less in the middle uh, of the intron, um, which is called the branch site. So of course, like mutations occurring here um, in any of these three sites will make so that splicing doesn't work, um, because the, the, it doesn't recognize the, the sequences anymore, and an intron might be inside of a, of a protein, or no, might be inside an mRNA, so not spliced out, leading to a protein which cannot function anymore. All right, so besides these small nuclear RNAs, we also have small nucleolar RNAs, which are a different types of RNA which play an essential role in RNA bio biogenesis. And these are not there to do splicing, be but these are there to do chemical modifications of, for example, the ribosomal RNAs and other RNAs, like the tRNAs and the snRNAs. Because RNA itself also has a, a, a chemical function, um, sometimes the, um, the base pairs, like the uridine base pair, and which you see here, needs to be adjusted to perform a certain biochemical function. So the small nucleolar RNAs are RNAs which transform, for example, uridine into pseudouridine. And this is done by Snow M1 um, as an example. And it takes this uridine base pair. And what it does, it is actually, it, it actually flips the side group of the, um, of the uridine. Um, has, so you can see here that the NH3 is moved two positions. So the whole ring on the, on the, base, or on the uridine base is moved two base pairs. And in addition, there's an OH group being added here. And this is very important um, because this actually produces this weird phi thing, right? So if you look at this, um, uh, tRNA. In the tRNA you see that there are some bases which are not really known base pairs, right? Because we said that RNA only consists of four base pairs. Hey, you have the A, the C, the, um, the U, and the, um, the A, the C, the, uh, and the G. Um, but there are, in RNA, there are other base pairs. So this here, this, this phi residue, that is actually a U residue which has been chemically modified into uh, um, a, a, a different chemical base pair had to facilitate like binding to the ribosome and also here to um, make sure that the anticodon loop and the, the T phi C loop actually bind properly to the mRNA. So there's a lot of chemical modifications going on and this uh, SNOW M1 is one of the most well studied and well known um, small nucleolar RNAs and which do these chemical modifications of this U base pair into a phi base pair into the RNA. So RNA itself, it has a very important biochemical function and it can only perform that function when it is modified. Um, and this modification again is done by other RNAs. 
Um, so, and pseudouridine modification is the most abundant RNA modification in cellular RNA. Um, here you can see still some more. Um, if you look very closely, you see here this M2G, um, which is a, a G base pair, which has um, uh, two methionine groups added to it. And you see that that happens a couple of times. And hey, there's so there's different. Uh, uh, there's different meth methylated G base pairs in there as well. And this is to make sure that it folds properly. Um, these um, these phi residues here, they are very important to make the tRNA, tRNA being able to bind properly into the ribosome. All right, so catalytic RNA um, is called ribozymes, so uh, ribonucleic acid enzymes. Um, so those are enzymes like more or less proteins made entirely out of RNA. And we already saw a whole bunch of them, like the SN RNAs and the SNOW RNAs. They are ribozymes. They are catically active um, um, enzymes. Uh, they're more or less enzymes, right? So they, they, they facilitate a process of modifying one chemical, pro uh, chemical into another chemical, and they are not used in the process. Um, and they are they, they facilitate a whole range of RNA processing reactions like RNA splicing, which is very important, um, viral replication, but also the tRNA biosynthesis because tRNAs, once they are transcribed from the genome, have to be chemically modified to be able to find their uh, or to do their uh, proper function. And of course there are like a whole range of ribozymes like the hammerhead ribozyme, the hairpin ribozyme, the leadzyme and the, the VS ribozyme. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of RNA molecules out there um, which are biochemically active and function as enzymes to facilitate uh, a couple of very important bio biochemical processes. So the discovery of ribozymes was done in 1982. So RNA can be both genetic material similar to DNA, for example, for viruses, and a biological catalyst um, such as proteins and enzymes. And then in the same kind of time, um, the RNA world hypothesis came around. And this is the hypothesis that before life on Earth started. Um, has, so there was no DNA, there was no proteins, there was only RNA. So RNA was, had, because you have RNAs which can kind of facilitate the um, reproduction of themselves. Um, and this is the, um, had the, 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 the RNA world hypothesis states that before proteins and DNA more or less were invented. There was a whole world which was alive and this world just consisted of RNA molecules copying themselves and having biochemical activity and modifying themselves. Um, and in 1989 uh, there was the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for the, disco for the discovery of these catalytic properties of RNA uh, by Sidney Altman and Thomas Cech. Um, and they, 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 they proved that RNAs can be both DNA, so genetic material, as well as proteins and enzymes. So again, a very important part of the RNA world. All right, and then we still have the micro and small interfering RNAs that we have to talk about, which are micro RNAs um, and small interfering RNAs. They are abundant in eukaryotic cells and they do post-transcriptional control over our mRNA expression. So when mRNA is expressed, there is a level of control on the DNA level. So eh, if, uh, if an mRNA is made or if it's not made, it's then transferred to the splicing speckles to undergo splicing, then it's transported outside of the nucleus and outside of the nucleus it can still be that no protein is being made from this mRNA because another RNA is binding to it um, and is, is removing this RNA um, before it can be transcribed into the protein. Yeah, so it functions by binding very specific sites within the mRNA and induce cleavage of the mRNA via a, a specific silencing associated RNA degradation pathway. Um, and that, that, that is kind of the TAD complex which does that within the cell. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a, it, there's a lot of control at every step. Hey, it might be that the cell nucleus got the message, oh, we need more of this protein, so hey, it starts then producing the mRNA, but once the mRNA is made and processed and brought into the nucleus, um, it's not needed anymore, um, so then it is degraded um, before it can start producing proteins which were needed 
like a couple of minutes ago, but not anymore. Yeah, so there, at every step in this biochemical process, going from DNA to protein, there is control um, and there is uh, a way to kind of stop proteins from being made. All right, so microRNAs are 21 to 22 nucleotides long, um, and they are processed from hairpin RNAs, which are encoded by cellular DNA, and they regulate gene expression by primarily inhibiting translation and promoting mRNA degradation. So they bind to the mRNA and then are more or less um, um, removed before they can do. So we know now that there are around 250 to 350 of these conserved microRNA genes in the in the genome and these microRNA genes are much longer, they're 20, 250 to 350 base pairs long. They form something which is called a hairpin and then this hairpin is, is cut into little pieces to form these 21 nucleotide long um, microRNAs which are then used to degrade messenger RNA uh, when when needed. So how does this look? So you have this gene here, um, so you have a gene which is then called, uh, which is then transcribed, the transcribed thing is a pri microRNA, uh, then you have the drosia protein which then cuts off the ends, um, so you get really this hairpin structure, um, then you have dicer which then cuts um, the the end of the thing off and then you have a mature microRNA um, which is then exactly complementary which is binding to the to the mRNA and degrading the mRNA or it is partially complementary and that means that it does translational inhibition and that means that when a gene is translated um, it uh, no when a when a and when a messenger RNA is translated it is inhibited so the, the ribosome cannot translate uh, the protein correctly. Um, so and again another form of control to make sure that proteins are only made when they are really needed um, and of course situations can change um, and the, the mRNA pathway going from pre-mRNA all the way to my, uh, messenger RNA which can be transcribed into the ribosome is a long process so this process is much faster and can kind of interfere and say well this thing was needed like two minutes ago but it's not needed anymore um, so we, we, we don't want the protein to be produced. Um. Alright so then there's still the non-coding RNA. So non-coding RNAs is more or less a catch-all name for all of these things in the group so um, you also have long, long non-coding RNAs and the, the RNAs that we talked about before are of course also non-coding RNAs because they don't code for a protein. Um, so except mRNAs, all RNAs are non-coding, so not protein coding. And um, there are some special long non-coding RNA families um, that are found to be uh, have a function in genome defense and chromosome inactivation. Um, these are for example the pi RNAs. Um, so the pi RNAs are very very important in um, the germline cells. So when um, when an embryo starts dividing and then starts making germline cells, so um, the, the egg cells for example in females, uh, these pi RNAs are very important to provide genome uh, stability. So to make sure that hey, when a cell is dividing that no mutations are occurring. Um, one of the other very well-known long non-coding RNAs is called XIST um, and this provides chromosome X inactivation in mammals. Like um, I think most people know um, when you are a female you have two X chromosomes and one of these X chromosomes needs to be shut down otherwise you would produce double the amount of protein that you would need, right? Human or males also have one X chromosome, so he, one X chromosome is, is more than enough. Having two X chromosomes is actually, well, not bad, but he, if you would express genes uh, on both X chromosomes, he, then you would have an issue because then you would produce double the amount of protein. Um, and there is where XIST comes in because XIST operates at a very early embryonic stage to shut down one of the X chromosomes. So the entire X chromosome is, is tagged with one of these long non-coding RNAs and this is a random process. Um, and then the X chromosome which has been tagged by XIST is kind of um, wrapped around histones. So the entire chromosome is more or less like 
wrapped around a, a couple of histones so it's not readable anymore and no genes can be transcribed from it so um, two very long of uh, two relatively long non-coding RNAs which are found to be very very important in early embryonic development um, so how do these non-coding RNAs work? Well, non-coding RNAs are more or less a um, made out of different parts. So hey, there's different functional domains. So for example, part of a long non-coding RNA can do binding of RNA. Um, there are parts which can bind to proteins. There are parts which can bind to DNA. And then you also have conformational switches, which mean that hey, there's a it's kind of a mechanical switch um, where, for example, if an iron molecule is found, the, the conformation of the RNA starts changing and this will then affect the other parts. And long non-coding RNAs um, are um, having a modular architecture, so they are built based on these different structures. And so you can, it's kind of a, a, a mix and match. Bar Kerpergen in German. What's a bar kerpergen? I'm 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 a little bit confused, Florian. What what do you mean by bar kerpergen? <laughs> anyway, a long non-coding RNA is generally made out of several domains. So it's kind of a mix and match structure. So hey, sometimes you have RNA binding and protein binding. Sometimes you have protein and DNA binding. And sometimes you have like a protein binding, DNA binding, long non-coding RNA, which also has a conformational switch. So that means that when it binds DNA, part of the RNA changes. So another protein can bind or cannot bind. So it's a, it's a very modular architecture. And these things can be kind of constructed, mix and match together. Um, and uh, cause these things. Ah, that X chromosome. You, you mean the inactivated X chromosome is called a bar kerpergen. kerpergen. All right. All right, so those were all the different types of RNA that I wanted to discuss. I know it's a lot. Um, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can see it in a light microscope. Yeah, yeah. But that's that. That that. Let me let me Google that for you. I'm I'm a little bit. Kerpershin. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly what it means. Yeah. So it's uh, it's the X chromosome which is more or less um, packed together. It's a very very small uh, um, All right. That's weird. Like when I look at my stream, I'm like half an hour behind. I hope actually everyone's able to follow the stream. Like I had some uh, I had a, a message from uh, Sandra that she actually had some issues. Um, going through the or, or watching the stream. So I hope everyone's watching the stream more or less in real time and doesn't have too many issues. Uh, okay, and now I'm back. <laughs> Strange. All right, there seems to be some weirdness going on with Twitch. So I've been talking again for almost 45 minutes. Um, let me see. We are not even halfway through the slides, but the last part is... Uh, all right. Skurita, very good. You're still here. Like, thumbs up. <laughs> Florian's still here. My moderator is still here. I think everyone's still here. Only some lagging during your galaxy. Yeah, yeah. It, it's because it takes over the entire video card and OBS doesn't really like that. So <laughs> I should have tried that out beforehand. But you can't, like, try out the stream. and then. Uh, all right. Commandos here as well. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so let's continue. Let's do another like five, six slides and then we will take a short break again. And uh, um, I think that we should be able to finish finish everything before five. All right, so back to the mRNA because it's the most important RNA or the most interesting RNA because it actually codes for proteins, um, which according to the dogma of molecular biology are the most important part because it's the effector things it's the things that things do um, so when we are interested in um, 
um, uh, when we are interested in, in proteins and we want to know how much of a certain protein is there, we generally, or at least in, um, in my field, um, we don't measure the protein. We don't measure the abundance of the protein. We measure the RNA expression level. Right, because the RNA expression level, hey, if you would take, um, hey, so if you would measure all the genes along the genome and you would kind of try and figure out how much of each RNA is there, hey, you would get a kind of a map with an overview of how active each part of the genome is. Um, and if you know that, then there is a very high link to how much protein is actually there. Hey, if mRNA is produced, then in general, we assume that the protein which is encoded by this mRNA is also there. This is not true in all cases, but it's true in enough cases that it becomes really useful. Um, so when we, when we look at gene expression, uh, we are looking at mic uh, or, or messenger RNA expression, um, and then we want to compare these different levels of messenger RNA expression between different cell types, for example, or between diseased cells and normal cells. Um, so he, normally we use that to estimate environmental or genetic effects on a certain phenotype, or we want to find differences in gene expression that could explain, for example, different phenotypes, right? Because if we would measure all of the proteins, it would be really hard because measuring proteins is much harder than measuring microRNA, uh, messenger RNA. Um, and the way to measure how much mRNA is there can be done in three different ways. Um, you can do this by using quantitative real-time PCR, you can use microRNAs, uh, microarrays, or you can use RNA sequencing. So, Quantitative real-time PCR is very small scale and you use a housekeeper gene as a reference. So more or less, this is how they do the PCR test for the coronavirus. So if you, if you think about uh, coronavirus, coronavirus is an RNA virus and when it replicates more RNA is being produced. Um, so what you do is you, you take a little swab, you put it in someone's nose and then you extract RNA from this swab and then what you do is you start amplifying this using a standard PCR technique. So you have primers which bind, which amplify the RNA, and this happens in cycles. Um, so every time that you do one cycle, you double the amount of RNA um, within your sample. So of course you can't really do this with RNA directly, so what you first have to do is transcribe the RNA into DNA. So hey, you get the little sample from the nose, you put it in in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a buffer and then you add, um, uh, you, you make from this, from this RNA, you make DNA so that it's more stable. And this is relatively small scale because this quantitative real-time PCR you can only do on like a couple of genes, um, but you can't do it on hundreds of genes. Well, you could, but then it will take a long time. And so if you think about the coronavirus, there's only one gene of the coronavirus that they're looking for, and that is the spike gene. Um, and there's a very specific part of the spike which is unique to COVID compared to, for example, uh, the standard or the other coronaviruses which are around. And they're having primers which amplify this very specific part. So in the end, what you get is when you start doing that, then of course, in the beginning, every time that you double the RNA, you also add a fluorescent marker. And so here, um, the on the one axis, you have the, the fluorescence. Um, so the, the amount of fluorescence in the sample. And then here you have on the on the x axis, you have the number of cycles that you did. And so in the beginning, there's no fluorescence. Why? Because the, the quantity of copied DNA, so RNA, which has been copied, uh, is, is very low. And the more cycles you do, the more copies you start making. And of course, at a certain point, hey, you will see that there will be this kind of S-shaped curve, curve, and this curve will start going up and up and up until you reach kind of the maximum fluorescence intensity that you can measure. And of course, hey, the cycle at which this thing starts coming up determines, more or less, is related to how much RNA there was in the original sample. And so you use a housekeeper gene and a gene of interest, for example, the spike gene from the coronavirus, and then you start just amplifying 
um, both of these genes, you measure the intensity of both of these genes and the ratio between these kind of determines how much virus there is in relationship to a normal housekeeping gene. For example a gene like actin or uh, actin is being produced in, in every human cell so you can see well if there's like more virus than that there is actin then that's bad because then you have a high viral load and you might be infectious while if there's much less vir virus compared to the actin um, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, but you always get these S shapes and these S shapes you can then compute how much material how much RNA there was originally of a gene in, in relationship to the housekeeper gene uh, that you are looking at. And of course we assume that the housekeeper is always expressed at a, cer a certain level. Hey, if you think about actin then everyone need or every cell in your body needs actin at a certain level. Um, so hey, if I'm comparing a cell from me to a cell from Florian or from a cell from Commando hey, then we will be expressing actin at a very similar level. Um, and then hey, the ratio of how much viral virus there was compared to this actin then determines or kind of gives an indication of how infectious as I am. Um, and you get these nice curves and these curves are then more or less calculated to be, um, um, and so you have a certain detection threshold that you set, the, w the cycle at which you come above the detection threshold that is more or less an, uh, an indication of how much material there was originally. And if it comes like two cycles later um, then there was like only one fourth uh, of the material compared to when you come two cycles earlier. And that is because every cycle you have a doubling, so two cycles means one in four, uh, three cycles means one in eight, and four cycles means one in sixteen. So, so this is how we measure messenger RNA on a very small scale um, and then hey, of course when we want to do this on a large scale hey, we can use microarrays or RNA sequencing which are able to measure well microarrays are able to measure almost all of the genes in the genome and RNA sequencing has as an added advantage that you can not only look at the individual genes but you can also look at the individual transcripts right because you are sequencing the, 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 the messenger RNA and microarray still use probes so they go on a fishing expedition so if you measure a gene you don't know which of the five transcripts of this gene is actually being expressed but when you use RNA sequencing you get more information because you can see exactly which transcript of a gene so which exons are in this transcripts and which exons were left out of the transcript and so it gives you a much better idea of which protein exactly is being produced. Alright, so quantitative RT-PCR overview is uh, very similar to normal PCR. Um, we will discuss this in lecture 8 together with the life of Kairi Mullis. Uh, we will have qPCR steps and have first you design the primers for your gene of interest, then you design primers for your housekeeping gene, then you do a PCR reaction with both of these simultaneously and then you determine the relative expression of the gene of interest versus your housekeeping gene. So RNA sequencing is, um, is, is very similar to DNA sequencing, there's just an additional step. The additional step is this reverse transcriptase, so um, re uh, re taking the RNA and making it into cDNA, so uh, DNA. And then of course hey, the cDNA is made double-stranded and then you add some single-stranded tails to, to make sure that you can sequence them and then you just perform normal DNA sequencing. So RNA sequencing is similar to DNA sequencing, it just has three additional steps. First the reverse transcriptase step, then the step to make it double-stranded and then single-stranded tails are added um, hey, so that you get these, these constructs which you can then um, just perform normal DNA sequencing on. So. so when you do RNA or DNA sequencing you have input and output in text format um, and I think I already showed you a FASTA or FASTQ file but I wanted to show you again last time it was not really readable. So raw data that comes out of a sequencing machine um, uh, comes out of a sequencing machine like, uh, like this. Um, so you have the name of the read then you have the base pairs, so the different base pairs which have been read, then you have a plus symbol and then you get the quality scores for each of the base pairs. Um, and so these quality scores are encoded using a certain ASCII coding um, because and of course you could not write like 10 or 50 or 100. Um, 
and when you, when you then do the alignment against the reference genome then you get an aligned file which is called a sum format file um, and the sum format file then has the same reads again as it were in the original fastq file um, but now it also has the position in the genome where they are binding so for example at chromosome 1 at this position this read is is attaching or is is a match to the genome so had DNA and RNA sequencing completely identical to each other except for three pre-processing steps to go from RNA to DNA and I just wanted to show you the input formats so the FASTQ format like I told you it has four lines for every read that it's being done so the first read starts with an add character and is followed by a sequence identifier and an optional description then you have the raw sequence letter a, T, C and G as determined by the sequencer um, and then you have another line so line number three has a plus symbol on there and it's optionally followed by the same sequence identifier so 99% of the time this is just more or less an empty line with just a plus character and then you have quality values for the sequence in line two and this of course must have the same number of symbols as letters in the sequence and these symbols are chosen in such a way um, that that a quality score is encoded um, for the sequence. All right, we're at 55 minutes. We just do hey, another slide. Um, reads are aligned to the reference genome, which is based on sequence similarity. We allow for some mismatches, and hey, this allows us to investigate the quality, so like uh, hey, which gene transcripts are expressed. Uh, we can look at the quantity, how much of a certain transcript is expressed and the added advantage or another added advantage of RNA sex is that we can um, have, a look, have a look at SNPs and insertions and deletions in the, in the messenger RNA. Yeah, for example, we can look to see if there are SNPs in the genome um, which are also found into the uh, messenger RNA um, or we can actually see if there is some RNA editing going on. Yeah, so if you look at a transcript, it might be that some of the transcript is RNA edited um, using uh, different ribozymes or using different RNA editing tools which are available to the cell. So RNA-Sec is one of the most accurate technologies to determine how much of a certain mRNA is there um, and it also allows you to determine um, are there SNPs, are there insertions or deletions and eh, quantity and quality. So which transcripts are there and what is the quantity of these transcripts. So RNA sec analysis exactly identical to DNA sequencing analysis except for one additional step. Uh, this one additional step is to extract the expression levels of the different genes. Normally when we had the DNA sequencing slides um, this would finish up with having um, here calling the variants, so looking at the SNPs and the indels. Um, in RNA-Sec we can also do SNP and indel calling, but the first thing or the thing that we are most interested in of course in RNA sequencing is to extract the expression levels of the individual transcripts um, in, in, a, in a gene. All right, and the rest is of course very, very similar to DNA sequencing. Um, there's just a DNA to RNA reverse transcriptase step at the beginning and the extract expression, expression levels at the end. All right, so again, RNA sequencing, just like DNA sequencing data, is visualized using the integrated genome viewer, like we talked about last time. Um, and of course, hey, we can see the individual reads. Hey, we see here the different amino acids that could have been coded, and then here you see how much how much reads there are. So just an example from our own research. Um, and um, I think we should stop here, um, have a little break of 10 minutes, and then I will tell you more or less our story about how we used RNA sequencing uh, to identify the differences um, between the Berlin muscle mouse. Um, so we have three different Berlin muscle mouse strains. So you see the, the, the really muscular one here. This is the double muscle Berlin muscle mouse. So it has twice the amount of muscle. And then we have two other mouse strains which have also got much more muscles than a standard mouse. Um, this is the standard black six mouse um, and, um, and 
how we figured out which region of the genome and exactly which mutation in the genome is causing uh, this eight, uh, 866 uh, phenotype, um, so the double muscled phenotype in our um, Berlin fat mice. Uh, Berlin muscle mice. We also have fat mouse, but I, I wanted to talk about the muscle mouse. All right, so um, if there are no questions, then I think we will do a 10 minute break. And then afterwards, we will quickly go through the RNA-seq example. And then we will talk about the free microarray data that you can get. And we will be talking um, a little bit about how to do RNA structure prediction uh, to predict the secondary structure of RNA molecules, um, which is part of the assignments for today. All right, so if you have any questions, let me know. Um, and I will already start or stop the recording.